This is a follow-up to the first part, which I released in October last year. It has been a long time coming, simply because I had to take the time to fully evaluate the depth of what is happening in the world right now. Not just in the physical sense, but spiritually as well. But there's a lot to get through, and this video will probably be longer than usual. The first and most vitally important thing to mention is this. Get right with God. That doesn't mean try to buy God's favour with good deeds or an appearance of good deeds. But examine your backslidden position. Acknowledge how far you have backslidden and begin your journey back to intimacy with the Lord quickly. Because it is not God that has moved. It's you, and in your heart, you already know that the only safe and right place to be is in the Lord's presence. In a world where most things are influenced by the enemy and his blind, willing followers, trying to live a life of holiness is difficult. And at some point in each of our lives, whether we admit it or not, we all stumble. But my dear, precious soul, now is not the time to be living in the shadows. We could potentially be right on the verge of seeing the Gog and Magog battle happen. And more importantly, God himself intervening in that situation to such an extent that all the nations of the earth will be shaken to their core. Every proud, militant, God-mocking atheist, every New Age, crystal-hugging, third-eye-focusing agent of darkness, every follower of false gods, Every humanist and every backslider will tremble and shudder at God's wrath poured out on those leaders and their many armies. Scripture clearly tells us that it will take seven months to bury all the bodies of those who dare to challenge God and seven years to remove and dispose of all their equipment and armaments. Now is the time to decide if you truly have faith to not only believe in, but to follow the Lord and become a disciple. It's not an easy path to walk. Like Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. It often means denying ourselves and turning away from Satan's buffet which looks very tempting and seemingly provides an escapement from any sense of responsibility. But in actuality, it poisons our soul and leads us further into darkness. I'm not going to hit people over the head with my Bible, but I would urge you to take a step back and examine where you stand with God, as this may well be the last warning you ever get to see. When he says, choose this day whom you will serve, he literally means no today, because tomorrow is not guaranteed. Tomorrow can only be hoped for by God's immeasurable grace and mercy. And many of us, including me, have already had an immeasurable amount of his grace and mercy, even though we don't deserve it. To say that the world has gone mad is an understatement, and anyone with eyes to see and ears to hear don't need me to tell them that. In just the past year, so much darkness has been exposed, and the tangible evil which permeates this world is no longer attempting to hide, 
but instead is trying to legitimise itself as the new normal. Reading from 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. But mark this, which means take notice. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. When we talk about the last days, we often think of it being a short period of time, probably because we use the word days. And it will actually be shortened, as scripture tells us, but not quite in the way that many perceive it to be. We've been in the last days for a long time now. You could actually say that it began just after Pentecost. But if we want to give the time and the days that we're living in now a title, I think it's more appropriate to call it the final hours or the last hours. Because so many things are ramping up all around us now according to scripture. Like birth pains, but increasing in magnitude with each passing year, just getting worse and worse. If I were to go over everything scripture has to say about the end times, this video would soon become very long. But I would like to look more closely at the scriptures I read just a few minutes ago from 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5. And I would like to break it down verse by verse because it's one of those passages that you can read over very quickly and not truly absorb what it's saying or who it's talking about. So I think let's, let's just go ahead and break it down quickly. 2 Timothy 3 1 This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. 2 Timothy 3 2 People shall be lovers of themselves, covetous, bolsters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. 2 Timothy 3 3 They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. 2 Timothy 3 4 They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 5 After we've checked ourselves, I think it's true to say that we all know people who fit with the description on that list. And we also read that in verse 5 it clearly says, have nothing to do with such people. Which basically means that we should not be associating with people like that, because if we do, then the darkness in them passes on to us. And before we know where we are, we ourselves become shrouded in darkness and behaving in ways that will that will go against everything we claim to believe in and in doing so we become enemies of god when you first answer the call of darkness it may seem like fun but the further into it you go 
the more enchanted you become by it. At some point you will look back, but the light will hurt your eyes, and you'll run from it, deeper into the dark, at which point it's begun to consume you. It will allow you to feel like you're in control, but I can assure you, you're not. I'm emphasising these points because too many inexperienced Christians end up being tripped up by the devil. They don't know that in the invisible realm they have a target on their back and are hunted by enemy forces with the sole purpose of leading them astray and away from God. The enemy knows his time is very short and he is looking to take as many people down with him as he possibly can. Let's be real, Jesus himself referred to the devil as the prince of this world. Satan has a lot of resources at his disposal and he knows exactly where a person's weak spots are. And believe me when I tell you, he will exploit that to the max. As I began work on this video, I didn't plan on putting so much emphasis on what I've been talking about so far. But that's good, because I wanted the Holy Spirit to guide me in what I was writing. Spiritually speaking, each day of our lives, we are navigating through a minefield. And only when we stay close to the Lord, do we have the discernment and insight to avoid those mines and pitfalls which seek to hinder and destroy us. Walking with the Lord isn't always easy. We may not always get what we want when we want it, but we will always get what we need. Just like scripture tells us, to seek God's kingdom and his righteousness first before all else. Then everything else we need will be given to us. Unfortunately, we don't always know in advance what we need because we are often driven by spare-of-the-moment emotions. But God knows exactly what we need because he can see the end from the beginning. With all that said, I'd now like to move on to talking about the book of Isaiah, because I don't want to leave the Jews out. I really would like to focus on chapters 52 and particularly 53, but I am going to examine the chapters either side of that as well, because there's a, there's a theme in there as well that's relative to the rest of this video. Isaiah 53 has been given many titles, names over the years, such as the Rabbi's Torture Chamber, and is more often called the Forbidden Chapter, because it's, it's forbidden to read in most synagogues, simply because it causes too much controversy in a religious system that doesn't believe it needs a vicarious atonement for their salvation. Let's take a closer look. I know that some viewers will already know what Isaiah 52 and 53 say, and how amazingly significant that is to all of mankind. But I also know that many other people don't know, so I'm going to break it down as much as possible without taking up too much of your time. And I'd just like to say thank you in advance for those people who are still listening, um, just for bearing with me, because this is all relevant and certainly very important. Now 
Now, the, the first thing you have to bear in mind is that the book of Isaiah was written around 700 years before Jesus. And yet, with the most startling accuracy about who, who Jesus would be and what he would do and what would happen to him. 700 years before he came. As much as ultra-Orthodox Jews struggle with what it says, they can't escape it. They've tried but fail miserably. Because as much as they proudly proclaim that Jesus didn't fulfil the prophecies to be their Messiah, they even less fulfil the requirements to be the suffering servant who will become the mighty king as revealed in the scriptures. The first 39 chapters of Isaiah centre upon the coming judgment and captivity of Judah into Babylonian captivity. And then, from chapter 40 through to 66, we see a dramatic change centering upon grace and salvation. Chapter 40 to 66 actually begins where the New Testament begins and ends in 66 where the New Testament ends. And that's why it's often called the fifth gospel, which covers all the redemptive works of the Messiah. In chapter 53, which you remember I told you is called the forbidden chapter in Jewish circles, we are introduced to the Messiah under the title of servant and servant of God. And I'm sure some people at least will have heard reference to the suffering servant, and that's who it's talking about in this uh, chapter 53. This is a real stumbling block to Jewish orthodoxy, because the text so clearly describes Jesus, it's unmistakable. Look at it this way, if a little girl gets hold of her mother's lipstick, she'll end up looking like a clown as she tries to apply it. And then the mother comes along and says, have you been playing with my lipstick? No, says the child, hiding it behind her back. It's, that's how obvious it is, yet even more so. And yet the Jews still try to deny it. It's just sad, really. The prophets had a consistent theme, telling of a future righteous king to rule from Israel. The Hebrews, knowing this, tried with Saul, David, Solomon. And Solomon, I mean, he drifts so far away from God eventually, and maintaining the kingdom. And he also fractures the kingdom into two halves. And then came Manasseh, who caused the kingdom to fall even further and to behave worse than those that God had driven out before them. The last 27 chapters of Isaiah are split into three sections of nine. The first section, which is 40 to 48, deals with salvation from the Babylonian captivity, in which God says he will deliver the people from the Babylonian captors, but only if they trust in him, love him, and turn to him alone for salvation. But if not, there will be no peace, no rest for the wicked. So now you know where we get the saying from, no rest for the wicked. The next set of nine chapters, which is 49 to 57, is focused on salvation from sin. And this holds the same message. He will save his people and not only deliver them out of their captors' hands, but also grant them spiritual salvation. 
only if they trust in him, love him and turn to him alone for his salvation. But if not, there will be no peace, no rest for the wicked. The last nine chapters, which is 58 to 66, talks about the future salvation from the cursed earth, which will be in the future millennial reign of Christ. But the final words at the end of chapter 66 say the same words. Those who reject the Lord will have no rest, no peace for the wicked. The consistent theme here for all of mankind is to seek after God, get right with God, trust in Him alone. Both Jews and Gentiles alike cherry pick the parts of Scripture which appeal to them and all too often ignore the parts they struggle with. I began this video with saying for all people to get right with God. We can't shortcut that process and the time to begin is now because the only time we have is by His grace, mercy and patience. But the day of reckoning is closing in and we must be ready because that day could be today or tomorrow. So what does it mean to get right with God? Well, it actually means quite a lot, not least owning up to our sins and repenting of them all. But a big part of it is to begin getting your dysfunctional life in order, to start doing the things in daily life you know you should be doing, and to stop doing those things you know you shouldn't be doing, and being responsible enough to tackle those changes until they become natural to you. Jesus said, whoever is not for us is against us. And that's a pretty large amount of people if you look around in the world today, unfortunately. But there is no middle ground. And if you are sitting on the fence, you're actually sitting on the devil's fence. If you're telling yourself, I'll, I'll do it tomorrow, then you're taking it for granted that there will be a tomorrow, which there may not. Moses took God for granted, and it didn't go well for him. I guess this message may have been a little strong, and uh, it even sounds like that to me, and I'm the one making it, but uh, I'd, I wouldn't say I'm the one guiding it, and that's the difference. But nonetheless, it's necessary, as there are way too many of us who claim to be Christians, yet live like the world does. I don't wish to try God's patience or take advantage of his grace. He doesn't deserve being treated like that. It's time for us to draw the line and put some distance between us and the rapidly decaying worldly system. So when the time comes to stand before him, he will see a person who showed gratitude and respect for the price Jesus paid for them on the cross at Calvary. Whichever people the Holy Spirit intended the message in this video is for, I hope and pray you'll begin your journey back to God today. May his strength be your strength, and may he order your steps back onto that narrow path. God bless you and be with you always. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Oh,